please welcome to the stage MIT Professor Jeff Hoffman. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. So uh, before I came to MIT, now, what, 22 years ago, I spent 20 years with NASA as an astronaut, made five flights on the space shuttle. One of the things that never ceased to impress us was looking back here at this very thin blue line, you know, on a beautiful sunny day, not like today. It looks like the sky, blue sky goes on forever. No, it's this tiny little uh, thin thread of blue that protects us from the harsh environment of space and, of course, keeps us alive. And this is the problem when you go into space, whether you are in orbit around the Earth or on the moon or someday going to Mars. I hope you've all seen the movie. Um, we need oxygen to breathe. Um, and Matt Damon managed to get back to launch himself into space. That was uh, you know, a pretty cool movie. What they didn't tell you about in the movie, though, where did all that propellant come for this rocket? <laughs> hey, we're Aero Astro. We know how to calculate these things. I don't have time to lead you through the whole calculation. I'll just put up the results there. <laughs> but you know, we know the gravity uh, is less than Earth, doesn't have quite so much atmosphere. 80% uh, propellant fraction, methane, oxygen, propellant. You're left with 30 tons. We breathe, you know, a little less than one kilogram of oxygen per day. And that's what most people think of. Why do you need oxygen in space? Yeah, if I were on Mars, I'd want oxygen to breathe, OK? But um, if I want to come back home, I need a heck of a lot more oxygen. And here's the problem. Uh, again, in Aero Astro, we can calculate what we call the gear ratio. To get one ton of anything on the surface of Mars, we've got to put 15 tons in orbit around the Earth. Now, a lot of stuff we have to send to Mars. Anything we manufacture, spacesuits, computers, habitats, we don't make those things on Mars, at least not yet. Um, dumb old oxygen? I mean, it's expensive to send stuff. To Mars, and if we could make oxygen on Mars, we're way ahead of the game. And so this is what I hope we'll see someday in the future. We'll send people to Mars, but we want to bring them back. And what I've just shown you is the problem. It's expensive to send things there, especially oxygen. So ISRU, which is in situ resource utilization, hopefully will provide part of the answer. This is what our MOXIE experiment is all about, the Mars Oxygen ISRU experiment. Um, this is a full-size 3D printed, uh, just to give you a sense of the scale. Uh, this is the actual instrument. You've all electrolyzed water in high school chemistry, right? Well, you can electrolyze carbon dioxide and although Mars has a very thin atmosphere, you know, 1% the density of Earth at sea level, it's almost entirely carbon dioxide, 95, 96%. So we take the carbon dioxide, we pull it in through a HEPA filter to, to filter out the dust, we compress it with the scroll compressor up there and put it into uh, an electrolysis unit, solid oxide, it's hard to electrolyze carbon dioxide. You have to heat it up to 800 Celsius. Then you pass it over a cathode with uh, nickel uh, it, as, as a, uh, and some rare earth elements. And then you have to run it through a special uh, ceramic electrolyte with scandium-doped uh, zirconia, which has a crystalline structure that only allows oxygen ions to penetrate, not electrons. So we end up getting basically 100% pure um, oxygen at the anode. And, and this is something that has been tested many times in a laboratory. But NASA has a rule that if you have a critical process or piece of equipment, and you know making oxygen for a trip to Mars, I would say, is pretty critical, you've got to test it first in the real environment. And that's why we had to send it to Mars. So here we are loading MOXIE onto the Perseverance rover. 
Uh, it doesn't look much like a rover here. It's upside down. It doesn't have the wheels yet, but that's, that's what a rover looks like in its infancy. Then we launch it to Mars. We land it. Uh, Perseverance landed uh, back in February of 2021. Um, it's a remarkable mission for many ways, not just because of, of MOXIE, um, and it's making a lot of firsts. On the um, business end of the robotic arm, in addition to scientific instruments like X-ray spectrometers, there's also a coring device which is, for the first time, collecting samples that we'll be able to bring back to the Earth because one of the main purposes of this mission is to look for potential evidence of past life on Mars, which is why we went to Yezero Crater. You can see this, uh, the river, and it set out uh, a delta. Clays and carbonates, at least here on Earth, are excellent materials for preserving fossils. Now, we don't know if there was life. If there was, did it leave fossils? If there are fossils, <laughs> you still have to be pretty lucky to find it. But we're trying, and uh, now we have deposited 10 sample canisters. They're lying on the surface of Mars, waiting to be picked up by a NASA European Mars sample return mission. And we'll get them back sometime, hopefully in the uh, 2030s. And in Earth laboratories, we have instruments powerful enough that if there are fossils or any chemical signs of life, we'll be able to detect it. The other incredible thing, I'm sure you've seen pictures, but back on <coughs> April 19th of 2021, we had the first flight of a aerodynamic vehicle. This was a Wright Brothers moment. It only made a simple flight. It went up five meters and came back down, but it was the first controlled flight of an aerodynamic vehicle in the atmosphere of another planet, like the Wright Brothers. On the 100th anniversary of the Wright Flyer, they put a model up on the top of the dome. I don't know if they're going to put a model of, of the Ingenuity helicopter, but it certainly deserves it. And the very next day, on the 20th of April, for the very first time, oxygen was produced on another planet from local resources. I'm sorry, oxygen is not as photogenic as a helicopter. You can't see it. <laughs> All I can show you is the, uh, is, but you know, we did it. Um, and what we set out to do was to demonstrate that this process would work during any season and at different times of day, the, the sort of shaded area is the predicted density profile in the course of a Mars year. We've been running now for over two years. We've run 14 times. Uh, this is kind of the set, and we're, we're due to run next Tuesday again, and we're gonna try to push our production up to a, a <laughs> 12 grams an hour. If we could do that continuously, which we can't because uh, we use more power than the, uh, than, than the um, rover can generate with its RTG uh, rate, um, and, and so we would run down the batteries. But if we could produce it continuously, we could keep a small dog alive. That's not what we want to do. Ultimately, we want to keep people alive on Mars. And so um, the, the people that, uh, the company out in, in Salt Lake City that, that has made the electrolysis unit already is working with NASA to produce a human scale. Instead of producing 10 to 12 grams an hour, in order to produce enough oxygen to get that 30 tons during the time between missions, you have about maybe a year and a half to do that. You have to produce about three kilograms an hour. So we're talking about scaling up MOXIE by several hundred, but we can do it. And so someday, I don't know when it's going to happen, um, we will send people to Mars. What's it going to take to do that? Well, what's really holding us back is that Mars is a long way away. Um, you know, the moon you can get to in a couple of days. Mars takes many months. So the things you want to be on the lookout for, uh, what when you know so you'll know we're actually ready to go is first of all if we can get there faster nasa is working with uh, the energy department on nuclear thermal propulsion and if we could get there faster we'd really really be ahead of the game because one of the problems is during that whole trip of seven or eight months you're exposed to cosmic radiation you have to have logistic supplies to eat and so on 
So getting there faster is really going to be important. The other thing to keep your eye on is how successful are we at going back once again to explore the moon? But this time, remember, NASA doesn't have an Apollo budget. And so this is the big challenge for human space exploration is how do we explore and not have a NASA budget, uh, not have an Apollo budget. And that's why being able to use local resources is so important. So I don't know who the people will be who first go to Mars or when they're going to go, but my advice to them, and I hope they won't forget, don't forget your moxie. <laughs> Thank you.